Hey everyone, uh, my name is Dan Abramov, I work in React and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been busy with uh, in 2016 and then tell a little bit about our plans for future releases in 2017. So uh, in 2016 uh, we released React 15, it feels like ages ago, uh, but uh, if you remember it killed uh, the spans in the text nodes uh, it supported SVG fully, uh, and it switched to using create element uh, for creating the DOM nodes, which is faster in modern browsers. So that was the 15th release, and we haven't really released uh, much on the React front itself this year, because we've been busy rewriting React from scratch. Uh, I'll talk about this more a bit in a second, but I think there was also some uh, like I think most important news uh, in React world came uh, not on the React the library side, but more um, in the things around React. So for example, we completely revamped uh, the documentation side. Uh, big thanks to all internal and external contributors who helped to make it better. So if you remember the previous React documentation website, there was this problem that uh, different parts of the documentation uh, they kind of referred to each other and there was no uh, simple path through them so that you learn each concept gradually. So uh, we were very inspired by work uh, in the uh, view docs particular. So uh, Evan, great job. Uh, I think view docs are really great in how they introduce concepts one by one. And this is something that we try to emulate. Uh, so I'm really happy with the new React docs. And uh, Another thing that was inspired by the work in other communities, uh, such as Ember and Angular communities, uh, was a project called Create Act App, which uh, uh, came out, I think, uh, in August. And it's uh, a common line interface for bootstrapping a React application. And we know that uh, React is not a framework, at least that's what people uh, often say. And we don't really have a preferred way of doing routing. We know that every React app is different. Uh, we use it at Facebook in a giant code base of like PHP code. Uh, and we know that other people are building single page apps with React and they have uh, a lot of questions like, how do I do this? How do I do that? How do I configure the build tooling? And we tried to take the best tools from the community that we found, such as Webpack and ESLint and Babel and combine them into uh, one package that uh, frees you from configuration and shows you uh, good defaults for creating single page React apps. And it's been really well received by the community and we're very thankful for over 100, uh, to over 100 collaborators uh, who added features and uh, I think did some pretty interesting stuff with it. So uh, that's Create React App. Uh, but we haven't really released major updates to React this year. And the reason is because we've been busy uh, with uh, creating a new version of React. It's a, a rewrite from scratch. And you probably heard, like if you're following React News, you might have heard the project code name. Uh, it's called Fiber. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the goals of Fiber, why we started rewriting React. Like everybody says re uh, rewrites uh, are a terrible idea. So uh, the problem is that I think at Facebook, we started seeing the, um, the cases where uh, React's uh, current uh, rendering model breaks down. So uh, especially with React Native, we noticed that uh, in Rea like when you write a React app, uh, it's composed of the components and components go all the way down. So it's uh, like a recursive process. And what happens is that uh, we have devices with, uh, we have limited time to render updates. And uh, it becomes problematic when you have a deep hierarchy and uh, when some updates are more important than others. So for example, if you have a feed, like the Facebook use case is feed, obviously. And when you have a feed and uh, there is a network response, we want to add a new item to the feed at the bottom but at the same time, we have an animation happening. And because React uh, is synchronous by default, so what happens is that we spent all this time rendering the uh, new feed item and the animation becomes sluggish. And so we see this as a conceptual problem in React rendering model that uh, 
prevents it from scaling better. Uh, so this is the problem that uh, uh, Jordan, uh, the creator of React, was working on for some time. And we, uh, we thought that his prototype was good. He had an internal prototype that solved this problem. And so we are incorporating uh, his findings into the new version of React called Fiber. And it also has some, uh, in addition to trying to solve this problem of uh, recursive rendering uh, by splitting it into uh, frames to keep the UI responsive. So this is like one of the uh, fiber features uh, that we're working on. It also has some uh, features that have been requested by the community for a long time. So for example, uh, if you open the React issue tracker and sort uh, the issues by the number of votes, uh, one of the higher uh, ranking issues is the ability to return multiple elements from render. So like, for example, if you're creating some, uh, like some layout that relies on Flexbox, it's important that the children are direct descendants of the parent. But as you know that uh, in React, uh, you usually have to return one element from render. And this means that you end up with a bunch of divs just because you uh, use components heavily. And this isn't very good for performance because you have all those uh, like divs that do nothing except contain components. Uh, and it's also problematic for some use cases. So uh, Fiber already supports uh, returning multiple elements from render. Uh, another Fiber feature that I'm really excited about is called error boundaries. So it's not really documented anywhere. We haven't talked much about it. Uh, but basically, this is like try catch on the component level. So if you're writing a single page app or any kind of complicated JavaScript app, uh, you might have seen this problem where um, some of your components uh, or views or whatever you call them uh, crashes, and the framework isn't able to gracefully handle that. So something inside of it breaks. And this is what happens in today's React. If one of your components crashes during rendering or during uh, a lifecycle hook, React enters an inconsistent state, and then some components may still work, some components may still be broken, you may get further errors. So it's a really bad user experience. Uh, even if you log the error, uh, it's still a bad user experience. So what error boundaries allow to do is they let you define uh, a component in the hierarchy that is going to catch the errors. And React ensures that uh, everything remains, it, like the app remains uh, in a good state. So uh, if something crashes, uh, you can catch this error at an error boundary, like for example, on the route handle level or on some widget level uh, and say, hey, an error occurred. You can uh, log it, you can try re-rendering the component, you can render a different component. But the idea is to keep uh, the app working even if uh, there is a mistake somewhere in the code. Um, Another feature we're adding in Fiber is portals. So this is a very common use case in React where, at least at Facebook, uh, we use a lot of like layer-like UIs, like popovers and uh, model dialogues, tool tips, uh, all this kind of stuff. And React doesn't really have a good way of dealing with it, uh, like a good declarative way for dealing with it. Uh, a common pattern is that people create a component that imperatively renders a component to a different DOM node because layers need to exist on the top level. So uh, something that we're trying to do in Fiber is we are adding an API, uh, a declarative API for saying that, hey, here's a layer, here's a component uh, that's going to be rendered in a different DOM node, but nevertheless, it's still part of this rendering tree. So it's going to appear in React DevTools in the correct place uh, with Fiber uh, incremental rendering, we're going to be able to split that work in chunks as well. Uh, and it's just nice nicer developer experience. Uh, we're also uh, going to make it a lot easier to implement custom renderers. Uh, so this may sound like, uh, like it's only experimental, like who creates a custom render for React? Like you might have seen some renders for console, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's an important use case so custom render is like React DOM is an example of the renderer, right? It renders to the DOM. Uh, React Native is another example of the renderer. Uh, but I also think there is a room for uh, some alternative implementations uh, of React DOM. So for example, uh, you might have seen there are libraries like Preact uh, that are smaller in size uh, that don't implement some features uh, such as event system uh, that 
maybe are not as useful with modern browsers. Uh, maybe they are less useful if you're just targeting mobile browsers, specific mobile browsers. So there are some trade-offs that React DOM makes that are not inherent to React itself. Uh, so what custom render allows you to do is you can write a render that uh, still renders to the DOM, but it's smaller in size because it doesn't use uh, the event system. And currently, it's very hard to create a React render because there is no public API for that. It's just like uh, you have to fork a bunch of classes, and it's pretty ugly. Uh, so what we're doing is uh, we're actually adding a pretty straightforward API so you can implement a custom render in a day. Um, so Fiber is a ground up rewrite. Obviously, it's kind of dangerous, uh, but I think it works fairly well. So right now we're testing it on messenger.com website at Facebook. Uh, we've been using it ourselves uh, as the team for the past few months. And obviously it was buggy at first, but I think it's pretty stable now. Uh, and uh, there is an issue where we have uh, a list of uh, remaining issues. Uh, I'll tweet that later. Uh, but I think we're in a good shape and we intend to uh, make Fiber the default um, uh, default React DOM renderer, uh, make it based on Fiber in the next major release. So that's going to be React 16. I don't have exact date for it, so we hope to get it done within a few months, maybe by React Conf, but no promises. I didn't say that. Um, but yeah, hopefully uh, we'll release it by then. But Fiber is just the first step. So this is uh, this is a conceptual uh, improvement. So it's it's completely different inside, but we're not uh, we're we're still going to have to work to realize the promise of Fiber. So not just to uh, release a rewrite, but actually find where uh, its uh, ability to schedule uh, updates with different priorities, ability to do idle work uh, uh, while the browser is giving the browser responsive while doing some uh, rendering components that we anticipate will be uh, visible in the future, for example. Uh, we still need to figure out how to apply all those new capabilities of Fiber uh, to make our actual apps like Facebook and Messenger more responsive uh, and working better. And this is something we'll be uh, busy with after the initial 16 release. So I think this is like, this covers most of what we want to do. Uh, from the less exciting stuff, uh, we plan to deprecate some APIs and to uh, such as create class because we're not using them and uh, we don't encourage people to use them. Uh, they'll still be available in a separate package, but we want to make the React core smaller as a lot of people requested. So uh, we're trying to dump some weight that uh, most people don't use these days. But we also obviously care about the migration path because we have uh, 25,000 components at Facebook. So uh, we're trying to keep React stable and uh, always pro provide some way to uh, move forward without breaking people. So I think that's most of what we'll be working on. Like if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. One yeah. question from Mark is, will there be much in the way of breaking changes for to the API or pretty consistent? Uh, so we try to keep Fiber itself, uh, like support the same APIs that uh, the current version supports, so we try not to break components and stuff. Uh, after Fiber, we might like we might introduce new APIs that are uh, better suited for Fiber than the current APIs. But in any case, we, as I said, we care about migration path because we have thousands of components. So whenever we, at React, whenever we make a massive change, what we do is. Uh, Either we keep the always supported, like for a long time, uh, or we create a code mod. So like a script that you can run on your code base and that automatically modifies all the components to the new like new API. So this is what we do at Facebook because uh, we can't just change React. Uh, if we change something in React, we actually it is our job to fix all the Facebook components to work with it. So I think it's, it's, it's going to, some things are going to change, but overall it's going to be pretty stable and there's always going to be a migration path. So last question from Sean Larkin of Webpack. He says, how long was the test planning process? And if other OSS maintainers wanted to do something similar, 
what kind of advice could you give for meticulous planning for a shift like fiber? Uh, so the way we did it is uh, it started like there was a prototype first, right? So Jordan built a prototype like a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago in a different language. <laughs> and uh, it was just to prove the viability of the idea. And later it was largely a one person effort. So Sebastian, who's like our team lead in a way, uh, Sebastian Mark Boge, uh, he's been working on uh, the first implementation of Fiber in public. You can search for uh, Fiber PRs on GitHub uh, alone for a long time, like maybe for four months. Uh, he's been working alone, just proving the viability and implementing the basic features. And once we got to the point where it actually kind of works, uh, what we did is uh, we created a giant issue. So uh, there is an, an issue called like fiber umbrella or something like this. And uh, we just discussed with the team, what are the stages of um, like, for example, the first stage is just to get it working. The second stage is to uh, get these bugs fixed, then get the other bugs fixed. So just prioritize. We have like maybe a hundred checkboxes in this issue. And then we just split those check boxes between ourselves and said, hey, let, let's do it. Uh, so uh, w one thing that really helped me, uh, so this is actually, uh, yeah, it's good that uh, Sean asked this. So one thing that kept us motivated through, throughout this change is that our manager, uh, Tom Aquino, he created a website called isfiberreadyyet.com. And the way it works is uh, we have a file uh, chucked in into the repo that um, contains uh, the names of all the test cases that pass with Fiber. So we use the existing test cases against Fiber. And we check in every time some uh, test begins to pass, uh, this is checked in so that we know that uh, uh, it, it works. And the website queries uh, the GitHub and displays, like, displays a line of green uh, dots uh, for passing tests. And this kept us hugely motivated because every time you fix something, uh, the website becomes more green. So I recommend setting up something like this. So that's really cool. Well, there are a few more questions, but we will wait for um, the JS Interactive that's happening in a few weeks. For everybody online who's listening and watching, bring your questions there and uh, We'll go from there. Thank you so much, Dan, again. We really appreciate it. Hey there. Are you into reactive programming using JavaScript? Do you have to deal with asynchrony in your web app? Then join this dot instructor, Ben Lesh, to learn all of the ins and outs of RxJS in his hands-on workshop. The next Rx workshop will be held in Silicon Valley on March 3rd and online April 13th. Go to rxworkshop.com for more details and to reserve your spot.